All right, so yesterday we finished talking about molecular orbital theory, and we said that electrons fill from the lowest energy orbital to the highest energy orbitals. Some of you asked me about some of the weird exceptions with the d orbitals. Because we're doing organic chemistry, we're really not going to get into the d orbital stuff, so the transition metal exceptions don't worry about. All right, really quick, what does an s orbital look like? Okay, so an S orbital we know looks like a sphere. So really it's not a circle, it's got three dimensionality to it, it's a sphere. What about P orbitals? Yeah, it looks more like a dumbbell, that's what a lot of people call it. So for example, we could have a P orbital that looks like that. I'm not going to grade you on your artistic ability, but we'll do our best. And in this case, it actually has directionality associated with it, right? So we can imagine on one axis here, we've got that x-axis, and we've got the y-axis, and then going in and out, we've got that z-axis, right? So we would call this p sub y for that orbital. So it's got the directionality going up and down that y-axis. All right, additionally, we've got other p orbitals with different directionality. So maybe instead of going along the y-axis, we have a different one that goes along that x-axis, like this. So that would be P sub x. All right, and then last but not least, you can probably imagine we would have a third one going along the z-axis. that goes kind of in and out of the page. It's hard to draw that on paper, at least. So we have three different p orbitals. How many electrons can we fit into all of the p orbitals? Six, right? So we can put two electrons in the p sub y orbital, two more electrons in the p sub x, and then two more in the pz. However, what happens if we only have three electrons, not six? Does anybody remember? <laughs> fills one each, right? So if we have three electrons, the first will go in PY, the second one will go in PX, and the third one will go in PZ. So that's what we'll practice next, is trying to fill in some orbitals. So let's do carbon first. All right, so carbon has how many total electrons, assuming it's neutral? So what's the atomic number for carbon? go over and we look at the table, it's six, right? So it has six total electrons, assuming that it's neutral. All right, so we'll make a note of that. Six electrons. We know the lowest energy orbital must be what? S. So we'll put that down here. What's the next highest energy orbital? 2S. All right, so we can put that here. What's after 2S? 2P. Okay, and we know that p orbitals always come in sets of three, so we could call this 2px, 2pz, 2py. It doesn't really matter which one you list first, second, or third, right? They're all equal probability because they're the same energy level. All right, so now we need to fill in these six electrons into these orbitals, and we know that they go up in energy, so I'll put a little energy symbol here. All right, six electrons. What should I do with the 1s orbital? Fill it up, absolutely. So how many can I put in the 1s? Two. Okay, is this correct? What's wrong? Yeah, they need to be spin paired. So one needs to be up, one needs to be down. So remember that too from Gen Chem. We fill so that electrons are spin paired. They're more stable that way. All right, can we fit any more than two? No. So the next electrons must go in the 2s orbital, same idea. So now we've got four electrons, and then we've got two more left over that we need to take care of. So we could put them in this orbital. All right, let's think about fluorine. All right, how many electrons for fluorine? So I'd say it's valence is seven. But is that how many total electrons it has? It has nine, right? So it's got two inner shell electrons that aren't valence electrons, so nine total electrons. 
But same idea. We'll do our two P's here, our two S and our one S. In this case, I'm not gonna bother labeling X, Y, or Z. It doesn't really matter in this case. All right, so same idea. We go one, two, three, four, go five, six, seven, right? We want to fill each of those orbitals individually, and now what? Yeah, and now we start pairing. So now we go back and we go eight and nine to fill up those uh, P orbitals specifically. A lot of times students get really hung up and they say, well, okay, this electron right here, which P orbital is it in? Is it in the X orbital? Is it in the Y one? Is it in the Z one? Doesn't matter, right? It's completely arbitrary. It's just saying that these orbitals have different directionality associated with them. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so now we can start talking about bonding. So in simple cases, unpaired electrons in these molecular orbitals, and I'm going to just abbreviate molecular orbitals as MOs, will pair with an unpaired electron from another atom. All right, so the classic example of this is the simplest molecule in our universe. What is that? Hydrogen. So if we think about hydrogen, it's usually H2. So it involves two hydrogen atoms bonding together. We know that hydrogen, if it's monatomic, only has one valence electron. What orbital must that electron be in? 1s. So we can go ahead and we can say, all right, this must be a 1s orbital for this hydrogen atom that has one electron. And then we can imagine maybe over here, whoop, make this bigger. We've got another hydrogen atom with one electron. And that electron must also be in the 1s orbital. All right. Now the question is, when we form a bond, are we making things more stable or more unstable? More stable. Otherwise, we wouldn't have bonds at all, right? All right. So it must be lower in energy. So I'll put this more stable state down here. And anytime we create something in physics, we must have an equal and opposite something. So we'll put that equal and opposite something up here, and then we'll talk about what that is. All right, so if we look at this, what we're gonna be doing in the stable state is forming an electron pair. One's gonna be spin up, one's gonna be spin down, and that's gonna be our covalent bond. So if we look at this with a space filling model, Instead of being two spheres, it's more going to be an oblong oval as they dock together and form that covalent bond, right? So this is referred to as a bonding molecular orbital, right? And these are going to be lower in energies. We know it won't, wouldn't be higher in energy to form a bonding orbital. All right, up above, do we have any electrons in this orbital? Not right now, right? We don't have enough electrons to occupy that orbital. However, we could theoretically excite those electrons in the bonding orbital to that higher energy orbital. We're not gonna to talk too much about that right now though. But let's imagine what this looks like. All right, theoretically, these hydrogens would still be bonded together. However, you would have this node in the middle where there's now a phase change. This would be called your anti-bonding molecular orbital. It's much, much, much higher in energy. If you go on and you take physical chemistry, you'll talk about this in a lot more detail. So hydrogen's nice and simple. The first chemist that were studying molecular orbital theory loved hydrogen because it was simple, they could explain it clearly, and it followed all of the rules very, very nicely. 
However, chemistry is not always very nice, right? There's a lot of exceptions to this. So let's talk about that. And if I'm going too fast or if you can't write down, just raise your hand and I'll scroll back. I know I get excited. <laughs> so in many slash most cases, orbitals need to hybridize. order for electron pairing to occur. All right, so let's take an example of this. All right, in this example, we're going to look at CH4. Does anybody know what that is? Methane. So first thing I want to do is I want to figure out what the heck this looks like in space. All right, so let's try to figure that out. It's not going to be too bad. We know that we've got one hydrogen, we've got a carbon here with four valence electrons, and we've got three other hydrogens going around. So we can go ahead really quickly and say, well, this must be a bond, that must be a bond, that must be a bond, that must be a bond. All right, if we look at this bond angle, what angle should it be? 109.5, even though right now we're showing it as 90, we know that we have three-dimensional space to work with, so we can actually spread these out further than 90 degrees. All right, so really a better view to show this would be to have one of these hydrogens kind of sticking out as a wedge. That means it's coming out towards you. One of these hydrogens could be a dash, meaning it's kind of pointed away from you. Third one would be a line, and this one would be a line. Now we're in good shape because this is more accurately showing that 109.5 degree bond angle. So I really like showing this one. All right, my next question for you is, what's the geometry? Not the angle, but the geometry. Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. All right, and yesterday I gave you that Vesper handout, and on the far left-hand side we talked about sp, sp2, sp3. Which category would this fall under, do you think? sp3. All right, so now we'll try to make sense of this from a molecular orbital perspective, right? All right, so on the left, we're going to just imagine unhybridized carbon. All right, and that was something we already did up above, so I'm just going to copy that down below. We know that carbon has six total electrons. And we know that the orbitals go from 1s to 2s to 2p, and when we fill them, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is unhybridized carbon. Can this form four bonds? Why? Well, when I look at unpaired electrons, we could form a bond with this unpaired electron. We could form a bond with that unpaired electron. That would take care of two bonds, but we couldn't do our third and our fourth bond. That's a big problem, right? So it doesn't accurately explain what's going on and methane. It must not be an unhybridized regular carbon system. Instead, what must be occurring is some sort of orbital mixing that allows four bonds to occur. All right, so let's imagine this. We're going to hybridize it. And if you remember, we said that it fell in that sp3 subclass. So now we need to make sense of what we're hybridizing together. So what do you think we're going to do? We're going to hybridize one of the s orbitals and three of the p orbitals. So we can go ahead and we can say, all right, it makes sense to hybridize the highest energy s orbital, not the lowest energy, right? So we're going to mix these two together. 
this one s orbital down here is going to stay put. Nothing happened to it during this hybridization scenario. All right, now we're going to get a new set of orbitals. How many do you think we're going to get out when we mush together the 2p orbitals and the s orbitals? Must get four, right? Because we started with three p's and one s, so we're going to get four. All right, and they're going to be kind of in between in terms of energy. And you see how this set of four hash marks kind of falls in between here? We need to show that. So it's going to be in between energy-wise. All right, and these would be our sp3 orbitals. We haven't changed the number of electrons in the system, though. We still have six. So we can go ahead and say one, two, three, four, five, six, and voila, right? Now we've got this electron that can bond, this electron that can bond, this one can bond, and this one can bond. We can now accomplish four bonds, right? So anytime you see a carbon with bonds to four separate atoms, you must immediately know, hey, this must be sp3 hybridized in order for that bonding to occur. Does that make sense? So this is a theory used to explain an observation. Oftentimes students get it the opposite way where we say the theory is what causes the observation. That's not what the case, right? This is just explaining what we see uh, in our natural environment. All right, so now we need to imagine an sp3 orbital. That's a little bit trickier. In fact, let's label this. So this was unhybridized carbon, and then this is hybridized. Okay, so what does an sp3 orbital look like? All right, my, my favorite description of this was actually from a student of mine, where he said, well, it's the love child of one s orbital and three p orbitals. So what must it look like? Anybody want to describe the shape? Is it going to be sphere-like? Is it going to be more dumbbell-like? Yeah, it looks a little weird. So imagine that we're merging together an s orbital right here, plus three different p orbitals. It's definitely going to look a heck of a lot more like a p orbital than an s orbital, because it's essentially three quarters p orbital like. All right, so when we do this, it's going to have one big lobe coming off the other side, but it's going to be kind of a fat, fat lobe. So it's going to be squattier than a normal p orbital that sticks out further. And then on the end, I like to show it almost like a little balloon with that nubbin on the end because there is a little bit of orbital density on the opposite side. So this is going to be 75% p 25% S. So if we think about this, this is going to be longer. This is now going to be shorter because it has some of that S character now associated with it. So it's going to be a little stubbier. Does that make sense? All right, so now let's draw methane. All right, we know we have to deal with three-dimensional space, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw my X, Y, and Z axes. And in this case, we can imagine this center dot right here is gonna be that central carbon atom. So if you want, you can even draw that as a carbon atom, or you can just imagine it being square in the center. All right, and we know from observation that methane is what shape again? Tetrahedral. So what we can do is draw one of these sp3 lobes sticking straight up like that, with a little nubbin underneath. All right, and then we know one is going to be kind of in line with everything, so I'm gonna just draw that over here. It's confusing, so it's not along the z-axis, this is actually flush with the page, right? 
And then we've got one that's sticking out towards us. So I'll try to show this using kind of a dark line. A little nubbin over here. And then our third one I'll show kind of as that back leg like that, right? So this is our tetrahedron. It almost looks like a three-dimensional clover. And then we have to account for the one electron that's in each of these orbitals. So I'll show one electron in each of those sp3 orbitals. Does that make sense so far? Got all sp3 orbitals accounted for and we've got our electrons in those orbitals. All right, now we've got to include the hydrogen. So one of the hydrogens must be bonded up here and it must have orbital overlap with the, the orbital, the sp3 orbital from carbon. So we'll just say that this is hydrogen up here. You can draw it in if you want, and it accounts for the second electron. All right, we'll do this on all positions. Each of these hydrogen atoms is giving the second electron to that covalent bond. All right, so up here, we said that this is gonna be our S orbital from hydrogen. It doesn't need to hybridize in order to accomplish its bonding, right? So it's just gonna be a plain old 1S orbital. All right, all of these blue lobes over here are gonna be the sp3 Also, if you have any colorblindness issues, let me know. <laughs> I've had students in the past where they're like, those are all the same colors. I'm like, oh shoot, um, I need to be more careful. All right, last but not least, what do we call this overlapping region where the covalent bond occurs? Does anybody remember? Sigma bond, absolutely. So over here, whoops. These are referred to as Sigma bonds. Sigma bonds occur when you have head-on overlap between two orbitals, right? Did you have a question? Yeah, is it like when you have uh, double bonding means that it's a tie? Yeah, so we'll talk about double bonding next. What's the second interaction that we run into? I think you mentioned it. Pi bond. With a pi bond, do we have head-on overlap? No, it's side-on overlap. So we'll talk about how that's different here in a second. All right, so let's do another one. Does this all make sense, though, before we get too much further? Okay, so let's do a different one. Let's try, whoops, this should be C2H4. All right, first thing I always do is try to represent this using um, Lewis structure and then make sure the shape is correct. So what do you think is going on with C2H4? Double bond. So we won't go through the whole Lewis dot structure process. We know that there must be a double bond and that there's no net charges on any given atom within this molecule. All right, what's the geometry for the carbon atom? Either carbon atom, it doesn't matter which one. Trigonal planar, absolutely. All right, what's the bond angles? I know I'm not very accurate with my drawing, but it must be about 120 degrees, give or take. Like I said with the problem of the day, the Vesper angles aren't absolute. They can vary a little bit. All right, and what must the hybridization be before we even do the orbital mixing? SP2. All right, so same thing that we did before. We're gonna look at unhybridized carbon. And we're gonna have that transition to hybridized carbon. All right, 
So just like before, we can copy down this energy system that we've drawn three times already. Got our 1s, we've got our 2s, and we've got our 2ps. And we've got six total electrons. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And in this case, we know we're going to hybridize. And we know it must be an sp2 hybridization. We already predicted that based on the observed geometry. All right, so just like before, we're going to take the s orbital down here. So the 2s orbital. And this time, we're only going to touch two of the p orbitals. We're not going to touch the third one. So I'm going to go ahead and hybridize those that I've boxed in blue. All right, so the 1s orbital is going to remain untouched. We know that the new orbitals that are sp2 must have three lobes because we hybridized three orbitals together. And they're going to be kind of in between energy wise. So these must be sp2. All right, what am I missing? Yeah, the 2p orbital that we didn't touch is still going to be there. It didn't go anywhere. So we'll draw that in right above. So this must be 2p. Same number of electrons. We've got six. So we go one, two. And now things get a little bit interesting, right? We go three, four, five. Where does the next one go, though? It'll actually go, jump up to the 2p orbital because it's so similar in energy. It's actually more stable that it occupies that orbital. The common mistake I see students make when they're doing this hybridization is they get really comfortable trying to put this down into one of those sp2 lobes. That doesn't actually occur. How many of you remember that with some of the transition metals? Yeah, some of the trans transition metals do this similar thing. It's actually more stable to have two orbital sets that are half full than one orbital set that's kind of partially half full, but not quite, you know? So in this case, we need to account for that 2p orbital having one electron. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out what the heck this looks like in 3D space. Okay, so what we're going to be focusing on when we draw this is this whole section right here. Did you notice when we did methane, we ignored that one s orbital? Why? They're not valence electrons, right? We know valence electrons don't do anything bonding wise. We don't need to draw them if they're not doing anything interesting, right? So we're gonna focus exclusively on these hybridized um, valence sets that we've got boxed in green, okay? But this time we have two carbon atoms. We'll just focus on one at a time. So we've got one carbon atom. I'll just draw it over here. And it's got an sp2 lobe coming off of it. All right, sp2 lobe is going to look almost like an sp3 lobe. But it's actually going to be a little bit shorter. Why? Because now it's only 66% p character. It's not going to be 75% p character. So it's actually going to get a little bit shorter than it otherwise would be because it's not as p-like as an sp3 orbital. OK? We know that the geometry for this carbon was what, again? Trigonal planar. So what I'm going to do is instead of drawing it flat on a page, I'm going to draw the remaining two orbitals going in and out, and you'll see why in a second. Okay, so we can draw one of these sp2 lobes kind of like this. And then the other one's going to be kind of going back into the page. So I'll do that with the dash. And we know we have one electron in each of these orbitals, right? However, if we go back up and we look at our unhybridized p orbital, that also has an electron, right? So I want to account for that. According to Vesper theory, where do you think that 2p orbital is oriented? 
Yeah, it's going to be going straight up. Because electronically, these want to be as far apart from one another as possible. So this is the most logical spot for the p orbital to be. And we saw that it also has one electron in it. Okay, my second carbon atom must look almost like a mirror image. So we'll go ahead and we'll copy a mirror image. Let me slide this over a smidge. So this must be sp2. And each of these sp2 orbitals must have an electron in them. All right. We've already made something kind of unique with this overlap right there. What's that called? Sigma. All right, and just like with the other carbon on the left, this must have a p orbital sticking straight up and straight down. And this must also have an electron in it. Students get really hung up on where that, where that electron is. Is it in the top lobe or the bottom lobe? Yes, is the correct answer, right? Why, why is that the case? Why don't we know where electrons are? Because they're super itty bitty tiny, have such little mass that we can't accurately know where they are at any point in time. The orbital lobes that I'm drawing are statistical probability maps. So we know that there's equal probability of that electron being either in the top lobe or the bottom lobe. So it doesn't matter to me where you show that unpaired electron. All right, now what happens is these will have some side-on overlapping interaction with one another. And somebody mentioned what this was called before. What's that called? Pi bond. All right, so if we think about a double bond, oop, that's not double. A double bond is one sigma bond plus one pi bond. All right, the pi bonds are always going to be side on overlap of p orbitals in organic chemistry. So we can always think of it that way. Sigmas are always going to be head on overlaps. All right, if we think about these carbons, are we going to be able to spin them freely? No, no they're going to be locked together because if we tried to spin them, what would happen to those p orbitals? They would no longer be uh, parallel to one another, right? If we twisted them, they might be orthogonal that wouldn't allow for bonding to occur, at least pi bonding. So this has restricted rotation about that carbon-carbon bond. All right, I think we've got enough time for one last example. Let's try C2H2. All right, same idea, we'll do unhybridized. Going to hybridized. And as you can probably imagine, this is the analog where we've got a triple bond between two carbons. All right, if we think about this molecule right here, what's the geometry for the carbon? Linear, absolutely. All right, and if you pull out your protractor, what's the bond angle going to be? 180. And what's the hybridization going to be? SP. Okay, so just like before, if we've got unhybridized carbon, it looks like this. And some students will stop and they'll say, well, this can do two bonds, right? However, it would violate a lot of different rules if we only showed these as sigma bonds. We need to account for the pi bonds as well. 
So when we hybridize this one, we're going to go grab one of the s orbitals and one of the p orbitals. Still going to have this one S kind of hanging out. Now we're going to have two SP lobes and we're going to have two P lobes left over that were untouched during this process. Same idea as before. Go one, two, three, four. Now what? We've got two more electrons. Where do they go? P orbitals, right? We must have them in P orbitals to account for the pi bonds, right? If we started pairing up the sp lobes, we wouldn't have any unpaired electrons to bond with at all anymore. All right, is this starting to make more sense? I know this is kind of abstract. Uh, yeah. 2P, right? Yes, this is the 2p orbital. Thank you. All right, so let's try to imagine what this looks like in space. We've got carbon right here. It's got two p lobes. We know that they must be angled 180 degrees away from one another according to Vesper theory. So I'll go ahead and I'll draw an sp lobe right here, sp right here, one electron in each, and same thing for the other carbon. That's not a great carbon drawing, is it? mirror image and we've got our overlap right here again what's this one called sigma so I like to label these and I'll ask you to do that on your first exam if we have a problem like this all right we've got hydrogens over on the edge let me actually get this closer these hydrogens also form a sigma bond overlap. And we've got three sigma bonds in this system. All right, but we're not done. What are we missing? P orbitals, right? All right, so we must have two different P orbitals. All right, so let's focus on this carbon over on the left-hand side. One of the P orbitals Kind of makes sense that it would be sticking straight up and down, right? So we could call this 2p. Where must the second p orbital be going? Yeah, going straight in and out through that carbon. Is that going to be easy to drop? No. But we'll try. <laughs> so I'm going to show this kind of with some 3D perspective to say like, hey, this is cutting in and out through that carbon right there. And we know the one sticking straight up and down has an electron in it. So that's the one kind of going along that major axis. And then the Z axis one would also have one electron in it. So I'll label this as a P orbital and a P orbital. Make sense? So same thing, we'll do the mirror image on the other side. Clean this up. I'll be honest, this always makes grading super interesting to see how artistically gifted people are. I'm like, wow, they're either way better than me or sometimes it's like, what are those lines? <laughs> so this one has an electron. <laughs> yeah, some cubism thrown in. All right, so if we look at this p orbital right here, it must be forming a pi bond, but with what other p orbital? Is it going to be the p orbital on the right hand carbon sticking straight up and down, or the one going in and out? Straight up and down, right? We want that side on interaction. So for this one, it's going to interact over here, form a pi bond. Some people will show the top and bottom. I'm fine with that. Does that make sense? So the top lobe and bottom lobe, because it's a probability map, they'll have interaction. And then same thing with these p orbitals. I'll kind of show this behind, if that makes sense. 
So can you see how we've got two orthogonal P systems overlapping to form two separate pi bonds? That's the point I'm going to leave you with, is a triple bond is going to be equal to one sigma bond plus two pi bonds. Does that make sense? So on your problem of the day, you'll see you might need to use some of these explanations. I'm not going to ask you to do full drawings. However, if you want to support anything with the drawing, you're welcome to. Does that make sense? All right, we'll practice this a little bit more tomorrow. Um, I'll probably even have an in-class practice activity that you can use to practice this to get an example of what, in it, uh, what problem could be on a quiz or exam.